Welcome back to Mechanical Design 1 course. We'll start the new topic, load determination. The outline of this presentation will be as follow. Loading classes, free body diagrams or FPD, load analysis, two-dimensional and three-dimensional, load analysis, static load analysis, 2D static loading case study, dynamic loading case study, and vibration loading. This chapter presents overview of the fundamental of static and dynamic load analysis, impact forces and beam loading. So we study this chapter with the assumption that you have some background in statics and dynamics. So please refer to your prerequisite course, Statics and Dynamics, if you need more review. Okay, so we skip some materials or we review them quite quick. We don't get into the detail again because we don't want to uh, present that Statics and Dynamics course again in this course, but it's just a quick review in one session. What are load classes? So in this table, you see we have four type of classes. You have stationary elements or moving elements in our machine or in our structure, or we could have a constant loads and time varying loads. So combination of these loads uh, and uh, moving or stationary aspect of elements could give us four classes. So in class one, we have a base frame for an arbor. So this is an example for the class one. We have a base frame for an arbor press used in machine shop. So what is the base frame here? The base frame is stationary, is not moving and it goes under static loads or constant loads so it's class one so the part is not moving and the load is static in case two is bridge a bridge is a stationary element so the in ideal case we could assume that uh, the structure of the bridge is not moving Okay, is stationary, but the load is time varying. Yes, so um, we have a truck moving on this on this bridge. We have car cars moving on this bridge. Yes, so we have a wind blowing uh, to the body of this bridge. So the load is time varying. For class three, we have this powered rotary loan mower. So this one, okay, so this loan mower uh, is type three. What is type three? We have moving element. So the blade is moving, the, the uh, structure is moving, tires, are, the wheels are moving, yes. So we have moving elements but we could assume that the load is static. We could assume that the, uh, the, the, the load uh, coming from the loans um, are static. Yes. So like many other engineering examples of machines, we need to make some assumptions. Okay, we don't have a perfect example of static load. We don't have a perfect example of dynamic load um, we need to make some assumptions and some simplification. So with some assumption here, we could assume that we have a class three load. And finally, we have um, engine of a car or most of machineries or engines it's type four. We have moving elements and we have time varying loads. Okay, so pistons are moving, we have uh, 
we have ignition we have uh, we have that uh, basically uh, loads uh, from the wheels and from uh, the garden and uh, we have basically a time varying load yes a variety of loads impacts vibrations um, sinusoidal and so on and so forth okay so the first step to do analysis uh, on either of these classes static moving part or stationary part or dynamic loads doesn't matter uh, the first step is to plot free body diagram of all elements so we need to separate the elements of the machine and plot the free body diagram what is free body diagram so you should be familiar with that from statics dynamics and when we separate first we separate it from all the connecting parts and then we apply joint loads either forces or moments uh, dynamic loads okay dynamic loads inertia loads yes um, the uh, gravity force yes and all basically possible forces and moments on these elements should be plotted and then we could move on and write uh, equations of motions or equilibrium equations uh, if this is a static based on either Newton um, dynamics or uh, Lagrangian dynamics or Kane dynamics okay so once we have free body diagram we could move on to the load analysis and load analysis we could use a Newton's law and uh, Euler's equation applied to statically and dynamically loaded system in 2D and 3D assumes that all unknown forces and moments on the system to be positive in sign and incorrect assumptions will give results in a sign reversal okay so if we don't know the direction of a force or moment we could assume one direction as a positive one once we solve the equation we might end up with a negative number that means that the first assumption was not true and that force or moment has a, a reverse sign okay for three-dimensional analysis any of several methods can be applied N Newtonian Lagrangian Hamiltonian Kane but Newtonian approach gives the most information about internal forces okay and we use mostly Newtonian but feel free to apply Lagrangian or any other type of dynamics if you are familiar and if you are confident to use them and apply them and at the end all of them will give us the same results Newton's first second and third law law could be applied okay so three laws of the Newton could be, could be applied uh, the first one the summation of forces is equal to mass multiplied by acceleration and summation of uh, moments is equal to derivative of angular momentum or h so mg is moment about the center of gravity and hg is angular moment about the center of gravity okay if you again if you want to uh, understand the details if you want to know where these formulas coming from please refer to statics dynamics we don't have that that much time to uh, get into the, the detail we review them quick but um, 
for proof or further study, please refer to those type of books. Three-dimensional analysis have sigma f equal to ma, f and a are vectors, and we could break them into three equations uh, along the x, y, and z axis. If the x, y, z axis are chosen coincident with the principal axis of inertia of the body, the angular momentum of the body is defined as hg is equal to ix omega x multiplied by i vector, which is a unique uh, vector along the x-axis plus i y omega y j plus i z omega z k, where i x i y and i z are the principal central dial mass moments of inertia about the principal axis. And we could write the Euler's equations. So based on the sigma mg is equal to h dot g, we could write the Euler's equation and the h dot g for the x, y, and z components uh, could be derived. And we have now three scalar equations, same as those we had for the force. And these are for the moment. Sigma mx is equal to ix alpha x minus um, iy minus iz multiplied by omega y omega z. What is alpha x? Is angular acceleration. Omega is angular um, um, angular velocity. Okay, so where mx, my, and mz are moment about this axis, and alpha x, alpha y, and alpha z are the singular acceler acceleration about this axis. Okay, so for example, omega x is angular velocity around the x axis, alpha x is uh, angular acceleration around the x-axis. Where this come from? Again, please refer to statics dynamics books. Okay, so how many equations now we have? We have three here for the forces in three-dimensional analysis, yes? For the three-dimensional one. We have three forces and three for the moments. Okay, so in total, we have six equations. Okay, are they enough or not? It depends on our problems, yeah? One problem, they might be enough. Um, otherwise, you might need some other equations. And the number of unknowns could be more than six. And so we need to find other equations. Let's review moment of inertia in this slide. You see mathematical definition of uh, moment of inertia. First moment of inertia is a tensor. It means that it's not either a scalar or vector. Scalar, we have only one independent component. In vector, we have three. And in tensor, we have six independent components. Okay, so it has a matrix form and uh, uh, on the basically diagonal of the matrix, we have IXX, IYY, and uh, IZZ. These are three elements on the diagonal of the matrix. Off diagonal components are IXY, IYZ, and IXZ. And the, the vector, sorry, the matrix is a symmetric uh, matrix. So here uh, you see that, uh, for example, uh, Ixx is integral of uh, y2 plus z2 multiplied by differential element of mass, dm. Okay, so it really depends what coordinate system we choose, yes? So then the result of these integrals will be different. We could use this x, 
y coordinate system or this x prime y prime coordinate system and we will end up with different numbers but if we choose or basically if we rotate this coordinate system and keep calculating these integrals until we reach to a specific coordinate system of x prime y prime while in that coordinate system we could get these off-diagonal elements, these ones, these ixy, iyz, and izx to be zero. Or <clears throat> basically, we could have only three independent elements of ixx, iyy, and iz. Then we call that, that coordinate system principal coordinate system. How we could convert the numbers from any coordinate system to other, or how could we find a theta that could give us principal coordinate system can be done by more circle or mathematical equations. Uh, we will see the more circle for the stress strain uh, analysis for 2D and 3D cases. And since the stress and the strain both of tensor, same as moment of inertia, the same technique could be used for a moment of inertia. But before reaching to that point, if you want to see uh, how you could find theta, or how you could find relation between the tensor of moment of inertia in one coordinate system and, uh, and uh, the other, then again, refer to static and dynamic courses. Okay, so static load analysis, <clears throat> as it is clear from the name, is statics, yes, so we shouldn't have acceleration. So if you back to the formula we developed in the previous slides and uh, just substitute alpha and uh, a or accelerations and linear accelerations and ang angular acceleration with zero then you will end up with these equations okay sigma fx equal to zero sigma fy equal to zero sigma fs fz equal to zero sigma mx my and mz equal to zero yes so this is a basically a set of equations we could use for a static analysis in three-dimensional cases. So again, six equations, which are a simplified version of dynamic equations. What about 2D cases? For the 2D cases, we only have uh, basically a force in plane of X and y in the plane of x and y we have force so we have sigma fx and sigma fy equal to zero and we have moment which is perpendicular perpendicular to the xy plane which will be this equation of sigma mz equal to zero so for the two k 2d cases we have only three equations Okay, for two-dimensional analysis of uh, dynamic loads, yes, so when we have a dynamic equations, but we have a two-dimensional, again, what we could do, we could just simplify our equations. We already had these equations for the moment for the three-dimensional cases, so these are the general equations. And on this one, since two-dimensional, so for example, we don't have alpha y, we don't have alpha x, we don't have omega y, we don't have omega x, and you see that we will end up with only one equation of sigma mz is equal to iz multiplied by alpha z. Again, this equation is based on the principal axis of coordinate system. And the center of that uh, coordinate system is located on center of gravity. For the force, we had these three equations for three-dimensional cases. For the 2D, 
then it will be reduced to these two equations. So now again, we'll have three equations for two dimensional cases. Okay, so before going to the further detail and with the assumption of you have assumption of you have a background of statics and dynamics, we'll move on to a case study. So with the help of this case study, we will review our previous knowledge and we'll refresh our knowledge of statics and dynamics. This is a case study of the book. Um, what is the problem? Determine the forces on the elements of the bicycle brake lever assembly during braking. So we have a bicycle brake and we want to see what's happening on parts of the assembly. What are the givens? The geometry of each element is known. The average human's hand can develop a grip force of about 267 Newton in the lever position shown. Okay, so we'll see the picture next slide. So now we have uh, the average force applied by human for, uh, human hand and assumption. The accelerations are negligible. All the forces are coplanar and two-dimensional. A class one load model is appropriate and the static analysis is acceptable. Okay, again, you are dealing with an engineering problem. And same as all engineering problems, based on the level of accuracy we need, we could make some assumptions. And these assumptions are based on our experiment, uh, experience, and knowledge, uh, and um, it's so on and so forth, yeah? Or we, we might need to make some assumptions, do some calculations, and uh, again, do iteration back and correct or initial assumptions. Okay, here you could see the brake assembly. The brake assembly consists of three sub-assemblies. The handlebar is one handlebar. The cable and the lever. The lever is pivoted to the handlebar and the cable is connected to the lever. Okay, so the cable is connected to the lever. And here is the handlebar. So you see the force is applied we have FP1 and FP2. These are the forces applied by hand grip of uh, human. Here we have force of the cable. And here the handlebar is connected to the main, basically the steer of the bicycle to the body of the bicycle and if you want to disconnect the, the handlebar from the body we need to apply two force and one moment. Why? Because it's two dimensional cases. We only have force of X and Y and moment of Z. Okay, so this will be a free body diagram of the whole assembly. You might need to back to this page or basically um, have the book open in front of yourself and back to this picture every time to understand what are the forces exactly. Now we want to separate these elements. What do we know here about these forces? We only know this force FP1 and FP2. Okay. The user's hand applies equal and opposite forces at 
some points on the liver and hand grip. These forces are transformed to a larger force in the cable by the lever ratio of two. Okay, so this force will be transported formed to the cable by the lever ratio of two. The weight of the entire assembly is small compared to the applied forces and is thus neglect neglected for this analysis. The broken away portion of the handlebar can provide X and Y force components and a moment if required for equilibrium. So the break even portion is the, the section that uh, we assume there is PX, PY, and MH uh, forces and moment. These reaction forces and moments are arbitrarily shown as positive in sign. Yeah? So we don't know if that sign is correct. We will see at the end when we calculate those forces and moments. The known applied forces are shown acting in their actual directions and senses. Okay. Now let's start with one of those parts, which is part two, two which is uh, the liver. On the liver, we have uh, these forces of FP2, A12, and F32. So this one is body 2, and when we say F32, it means that this is a force applied from body 3 to body 2. And the F12 is the force applied from the body 1 to body 2. So this one is from the cable, and this one is from the, the handlebar. Okay. These are the distances R12, RB2, R32. These are the distances and all of them are known. So as we assume we have uh, static uh, forces and static case, uh, case then uh, we could write static equilibrium equations, sigma fx equal to zero, sigma fy equal to zero, and sigma mz equal to zero. And uh, you see this is the moment around the center of gravity. Uh, so you see, for example, for the F12, F12, uh, the moment is equal to R multiply by force, so F12 multiply by, sorry, R12 multiply by F12. And this one is vector multiplication, yes, and uh, if, if we sum up all these moments, then we'll have the total moment around the center of gravity. The last one is simplified because this one is a vector uh, presentation. If you break it down and uh, make it basically a scalar presentation, we'll have this equation. Okay, do this in home. It's a good practice. Do it by yourself and see how this equation is derived. Okay, now we have three equations and four unknowns. Four unknowns are F12x, F12y, F32x, and F32y at this point. So we need another equation. It is always available from the fact that direction of F32 is known the cable can pull only along its axis. We can express a component of 
the cable force F32 in terms of other components and the known angle theta of the cable. So F32Y is equal to F3TX multiplied by tangent of theta. This will be our force equation. So now we have AB and C equation. Now let's move on to the third body, part three, which is the cable free body diagram of this body. We have force of the cable. We have F23 is the force applied from the lever to the cable. And we have F13 is the force applied from the handlebar to this part. Again, by assumption of static equations, we could have sigma fx equal to zero, sigma fy equal to zero, and now we'll have another equation D. And for the part one, same, we could have the forces. Okay, so we could have the forces. Uh, F31 here, yes, F21 here, and this is a F she's. Okay, so this is a force coming from the cable. And we could write the equation sigma fx and sigma fy equal to zero and sigma mz equal to zero. And if we expand this equation and write the scalar form, then we could have this equation f, e, and f. So now the total of unknowns at this point is 21. These are all unknowns. We have only nine equations so far, and we need 12 more equations to solve this system. So why nine equation? From body two, we had four equations. From body three, we had two equations, and from body, body one, we had three equations. So, so far we have nine equations. So we could use Newton's third law, react action reaction. So action forces are equal to reaction forces with the opposite sign. So F23x is equal to minus F32x. F21x is equal to minus F12x and so on and so forth, yes. So you see the F she is, is equal to minus f cable okay if she is, is basically reaction force on the on the handlebar from the cable okay so some of the forces we know that they are equal and uh, opposite in sign like FP1X is equal to minus FP2X and FP1Y is equal to minus FP2Y. These are the forces coming from the hand of the bicycle rider. Horizontal forces, we know that uh, the Y component of the cable force is equal to zero and y component of the sheath force is equal to zero. Uh, by making assumption of no friction on the horizontal, basically, uh, component of F31, then we could assume that F3x is equal to zero. What is F this F31 back to the main assembly free body diagram and identify it again. Yes, so for all of these forces, just look at those free body diagrams and see 
what are they and why we made these assumptions and if they are true or not. Now we have complete 21 equations. can simplify the problem some substitute equations b and c in equation a to get this equations or set of equations of k and substitute minus f32 x for f32 x and minus f32 y for f23 y from equations g and get this l equations so we have a new set of equations and we call it l okay so just making some simplifications yes you might uh, you might find a better way of doing those simplifications or finding uh, the unknowns one by one from a different method doesn't matter you could um, you could solve it by a, a different way but at the end, you will end up with the same numbers. For link one, substitute equation f in E and replace f2x with f12x, f2y with minus f12y, f31x with minus f13x, f31y with minus f31y, and f she's x with minus f cable from g. Yes, so making some uh, simplifications and substitutions and now we have uh, m have new set of equations m substitute h i and j in to equations k l and m by putting them in standard form which has all unknown terms on the left and all known on the right of the equation sign. Okay, so we have all unknown on the left side and we have all the known on the right side. Why putting this in the standard equation? Just this is a basically systematic solution and is very suitable for solvers. If you want to write, uh, write, uh, a, a, if you want to write a, a, a routine, a computer routine program, let's say MATLAB code, is C++ code, and uh, you could follow this method to have a systematic solution. And then, so for the solution, you see that we have A matrix, okay, so all of the components are known we have x matrix all of or unknowns and we have b matrix again all are known yes so ax equal to b and we could use different matrix uh, method to find the unknowns Okay, so matrix solver, any matrix solver could be used um, to basically solve that equation. So these are the given data, these are the calculated data, and finally we have all of the forces. So what we have done, let, yes, yes, so let's um back to a big picture what we've been doing in this case study we've been doing force analysis first we made some assumption that uh, the forces are static parts are not moving and we wanted to do force analysis we want to find all the forces and moments find the forces and moments we need these forces and moments later for further analysis of a stress and a strain and the failure theories and etc. Okay, so statics and dynamics is the main fundamental core of this course. 
you should be good enough to do static analysis and dynamic analysis because this is the first point to do further analysis and, and to basically design or machine. Okay, there are other examples or case studies in the book, case study 2A, page 84, case study 3A, page 88, and case study 4A, page 94 is three-dimensional case. Um, I strongly suggest you to refer to these case studies and see how did they plot free body diagram, how did they accomplish assumptions, and how they managed to write uh, static or dynamics equations and uh, solve finally equations and form unknowns. Okay. We'll have one example for dynamic load analysis. Uh, is an, this another case study of the book. In this case study, the problem is uh, determining the theoretical rigid body forces acting in two dimensions on the four bar li linkage. So we have a four bar linkage mechanism and we want to do some uh, force analysis. What are the givens? The linkage geometry masses, mass moment of inertia are known, and the linkage is driven at up to 120 RPM by a speed controlled electric motor. Okay, so this is the given. An assumption the accelerations are significant. So it means that we cannot ignore acceleration. We should do dynamic analysis. A class four load model is appropriate and the dynamic analysis is required. There are no external loads on the system. All loads are due to the accelerations of the links. The weight forces are insignificant compared to the internal forces and will be neglected. The links are assumed to be ideal rigid bodies. Friction and the effects of clearances in the pin joints are also ignored. So these are our assumptions. Okay, so here we have four bar linkage mechanism. What is four bar linkage mechanism? It basically has four linkages. The first one is ground. Second, third, and fourth. Okay, one, two, three, and four. The second one is crank, third one is coupler, the fourth one is rocker. So crank, coupler, rocker, and we have a motor here on the crank that drives the whole mechanism. We have the lengths L1, L2, L3, and L4. What is L1? This distance between the pins or support. L2 is the distance from this pin here. And O2 to A. L3 is the distance from A to B. And L4 is the distance from B to O4. We had Omega 2 on the crank, we had alpha 2 and T2 of the crank as well. Those were given. And now we want to find reaction forces in these supports 
and other unknowns like velocity and acceleration of other bodies so again uh, same as any other problems we need to break our system into bodies here we have free body diagram and link to okay so this is link to what do we have we have uh, acceleration force on center of gravity or this ag2 we have forces on the pin of the support f12 so force applied from body one to body two and we have f32 on this pin from body three to body two okay so we could write equations it's two-dimensional problem but it's a dynamic case yes so we have three set of equation for each body sigma fx equal to m2a g2 sigma fy is equal to mt m2 a g2 i and sigma mz is equal to i g2 alpha 2 what is uh, basically mg is summation of all the moments what are those moments t2 is the basically the torque of the motor torques of f12 f32 x and y components around the center of gravity for the link tree same method could be applied and we could have three equations please write these equations by yourself one by one to understand how these equations are derived and for the body four again same similar set of equations could be derived now there are three unknowns in these nine equations so now we have three uh, sorry nine equations three for each body nine equations and 13 unknowns four third law equations can be written to equate the action reaction pairs at the joints so f 32 x is equal to minus f 23 x and same for the other three forces okay now we have nine plus four 13 equations and 13 unknown and what we could do again we could use a matrix solver and find all these unknowns I encourage you to write those equations and use a matrix solver, either the one provided with the CD of the book or any other matrix solvers online or in softwares, or you could just write the matrix solver by yourself in C, use these softwares to calculate these unknowns okay now we could do further analysis on force reaction forces from the ground so these are ground reaction forces here f21 and f41 uh, on two supports um, so here basically if we change the crank angle or theta we could solve equations again and find reaction forces f12 and here we have a force reaction force against a crank angle in degrees from zero to 360s when so 
when the crank rotates from 0 to 360, you could see how those reaction forces changes. Same for the second support, you could find the forces against a crank's angle. So how this analysis could help us in design, you will see that what is the maximum force on the support? Okay, so the maximum force happens uh, around uh, 30 degrees here, okay? And this support, and also on this support, yes, both of that happens around this 30 degrees almost, yes? And by doing this type of analysis, then we could select this maximum force, and calculate our factor of safety and do our failure analysis and stress uh, strain analysis, find the critical stress and uh, basically uh, find the best support for the material, for the thickness and uh, other geometry or design factors. Okay, that was about statics and dynamics forces. We have also other kind of forces, vibration forces, impact forces. I don't cover impact forces, although you have a section in the book, you could study that part by yourself. But, but we go just briefly on the vibration loading and I leave the impact forces to yourself to study if you wish, uh, but we will mostly deal with static and dynamic forces. So if not using FEA, which is find element analysis, we would like to determine at a minimum the system's lowest or fundamental natural frequency. Since this frequency will usually create the largest magnitude of vibrations. So we are always looking for the maximum values, either in dynamic forces or static forces or vibration. <clears throat> and uh, covering all the fundamental forces um, oh, sorry, uh, covering all the natural forces um, will be very computational heavy. We don't have that much time to spend and it wouldn't be necessary. So we just need to find fundamental or the lowest natural frequency because the largest magnitude of vibration happens at that frequency. The undamped Fundamental natural frequency omega n with units of radian per second or fn with units of hertz can be computed from the expressions omega n is equal to a square root of k over m and k is stiffness, m is mass and fn is equal to omega n divided by 2 pi. Okay, so if we could simplify our model to just a single mass and spring, then we can find the natural frequency. M is the moving mass of the system in true mass units, and K is the effective spring constant of the system. The above equation is based on a single degree of freedom lumped model of the system. So in some cases we might be able to make assumptions and assume that we have a long mass and we have a single degree of freedom. Okay, so in this case here we have a cam and follower. And cam rotates and follower basically goes up and down with 
displacement of y with velocity of y dot and acceleration of y double dot and can rotates with angular velocity of omega. This is an actual system. Then we could make assumption of long system and simplify your model by a, a one degrees of free, one degree of freedom long model. Okay, so here we have a spring. This is the spring of the system. We have damper. This damper uh, has a damp damping properties of the follower. We have a mass, which has a mass of the whole system, uh, roller, uh, the, the bar, and so on and so forth. All of that. Basically, all mass of this follower could be assumed concentrated on the mass M here. And now we could uh, have a free body diagram of the F cam, the force applied by the cam, this roller, uh, force of the spring and the force of the damper. Okay, so spring constant K is an assumed linear relation between the force F applied to an element and is resulting deflection delta. So K is force divided by delta. If an expression for the deflection of an element can be found or a drive, it will provide the spring constant relation. Spring deflection is equal to the displacement Y of the mass. Okay, so K is force divided by Y. Okay, and the Y is just a deflection of the spring, force the force supply, and K is the stiffness of the spring. All the damping or frictional losses are long in the damping coefficient D. For this simple model, damping is assumed to be inversely proportional to the velocity Y dot of the mass. So damping is force divided by Y dot force is equal to damping multiplied by velocity. If damping is included, the expression for the fundamental damp natural frequency omega d with, with units of hertz become omega d is equal to square root of k or m minus d divided by 2m to the power of 2. And fd is equal to omega d divided by 2 pi. So again, why do we need this fundamental natural frequency? Because the maximum vibration and the maximum force happens at this frequency. This damp frequency will be slightly lower than the undamped frequency. Effective mass for a long model is summing all the values of the connected moving masses. A condition called resonance can be experienced if the operating or forcing frequency applied to the system is the same as any of its natural frequency. Okay, so if the frequency of the force applied is the same as uh, one of the natural frequency and the worst case happens when it's equal to the fundamental natural frequency or the lowest natural frequency, then we see the maximum vibration in the system. This is if the input angular velocity applied to a rotating system is the same as or close to omega n, the vibratory response will be very large. This can create large forces and cause failure. Thus, it is necessary to avoid operation at or near the natural frequencies if possible. So, you might have this topic before in physics or statics dynamics, but for now, for the purpose of this course at this moment, first we want to know that what is the natural frequency, the maximum for forces and vibrations happens at this 
natural frequency and we must avoid this natural frequency for example when you drive a car specifically old models you see that the car starts to shake and vibrate at i don't know speed of 100 km per hour but if you pass that speed or if you lower the, your speed then that shaking and vibration stops okay so here we have a video um, Okay, now we want to drive differential equation of motion. We uh, already developed our free body diagram, and we know that sigma f is equal to ma and uh, a is equal to y double dot. 
and then we could expand the equation and write f ka minus f spring minus f damper is equal to my double dot and f ka which is our external force is equal to my double dot plus dy dot which is the damper force and plus ky which is the spring force now we have this forced differential equation and we could use this type of equation to uh, develop some uh, mathematical formula to find natural frequency and do further analysis on vibration or doing vibration analysis okay so this slide concludes our topic on statics dynamics forces uh, please do further study back to statics dynamics courses uh, and uh, study the book the section the chapter three of the book by yourself to review your previous knowledge and have a good and a strong base for the following chapters and coming chapters